Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Nancy Kalick. I'm very happy to see you all this afternoon. I am uh, filling in for Trisha Rose this semester as interim director of the CSREA, where we support and help to generate rigorous and accessible research, performance art, and scholarship on a broad range of issues that pertain to race and ethnicity in the US. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Eric Tang, who will be giving us a lecture entitled Unsettled on Cambodian Refugees in the New York City hyper ghetto. But before we get to that, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements and then more formally introduce our guest. Tomorrow, Professor Tang will also um, be giving a research seminar uh, entitled From Camps to Ghettos, Thinking in Refugee Time. And that's in our conference room at the CSREA over in the Hillel building on the third floor. And that'll be tomorrow at 10 AM. Um, Today, though, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Eric Tang, who uh, works at the African and African Diaspora Studies Department uh, at, the at the University of Texas, Austin. And he's also a faculty member in the Center for Asian American Studies. He's got connections with the Department of Sociology there and serves as a faculty fellow with both the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis, as well as the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. His interests, broadly speaking, are racism and anti-racism, the poetics of displacement, urban unrest, and activist research. His first book, Unsettled, uh, about which we'll hear today, is an ethnographic account of refugee life in some of New York City's most impoverished and socially marginalized neighborhoods. A former community organizer, Professor Tang has published several seminal articles on race and urban social movements, including his award-winning writing on post-Katrina New Orleans. His current research focuses on the past and present of racial segregation in Austin, Texas, and pays particular attention to the gentrification-driven displacement of the city's longstanding African-American residents. He's currently working on a new book, which will be published by University of Texas Press, which is entitled East Avenue, African-Americans in Austin's Terrain of Inequality, and we will eagerly await that publication. But today we get to hear about the first fascinating book. So please join me in, helping, uh, in welcoming Dr. Tang. Thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you to the center for hosting me, uh, to Tricia Rose, who's deservedly on sabbatical, um, to, uh, to Caitlin and Christina for making these arrangements, and to all my good friends here at, at Brown. Um, I never have a bad time when I come to Brown. It's always fun, especially when you know global warming gives us 60 degree weather, and which should be, you know, winter time. But don't think about that. You're not here to think about that. Um, well, it's, again, a pleasure to be here. And, you know, this is uh, an interesting time to talk about refugees, isn't it? Like, the book had come out in October, and no less than a month, month and a half later, there were the Paris attacks, and all of a sudden, refugee resettlement, which pretty much flies under the radar as far as policy is concerned, became not just a hot button issue, but one of the most polarizing political issues of our political moment. So, refugees, you know, they, and refugee resettlement policy is by and large a bipartisan issue because refugees give something. To everyone, for Republicans and you know the hawkish, it is a um, is proof positive that you know U.S. liberalism is should be globally hegemonic because why else would these refugees want to come here? Um, and for liberals, Democrats, it is an occasion to celebrate U.S. humanitarian largesse, right? And so, for the most part, it's gone gone by, flown, flown by as, as, an, as a bipartisan issue until now. For the past three or four decades, um, we've, we haven't seen the kind of polarization that refugee resettlement has, has given us. And at the same time, we're also experiencing, witnessing a resurgent movement led by African Americans against state violence in the United States. And so what I want to do today is speak a little bit about the book, 
introduce some of the main themes, but then have some discussion about the intersection of these two hot button issues, right? Refugee resettlement and this movement against state violence. So I'm going to begin by, um, well, actually, I'm going to begin by doing this. Someone told me I need to do this before every presentation. <laughs> I'm not going to explain <laughs> what that is or why I'm doing it. I assume you all know. <laughs> and then I don't have to betray just how inept I am when it comes to social media. But there you go. <laughs> Are we good? OK. OK. So I'm going to begin with a quote from a full page ad taken out in the New York Times on March 19th, 1978. Hey, exactly to the date. Um, what would that be, 36 years ago? No, 38 years ago. OK, here's the quote. We call upon, and, and can you hear me okay? Do I have this position properly? Okay. We call upon President Carter and the United States Congress to facilitate the entrance of these refugees into the United States. If our government lacks compassion for these dispossessed human beings, it is difficult to believe that the same government can have much compassion for America's black minority or for America's poor. Signed, Black Americans Urge Admission of Indo-Chinese Refugees, full page added in the New York Times, March 19th, 1978. And now I'm going to begin with a quote from Blanca Ramirez, a housing organizer in the Northwest Bronx, who in 1985 was one of the first community members in that area to greet the refugees upon their arrival to the Bronx. Quote, when we first went to visit the refugee families at 193rd, the conditions were horrible. End quote. Blanca Ramirez recalled, quote, there was no heat, no hot water. The windows were broken. It was freezing and you could see your breath in the air. It was like nothing I had seen before. End quote. It was 1985 and Ramirez was a housing organizer with the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, a group at the forefront of organizing Bronx tenants who are victims of various housing abuses, ranging from habitability violations to bank redlining. Ramirez was among the first residents to reach out to the Cambodians who were moving into the apartment buildings in the area. As it happened, Ramirez had been monitoring these buildings for nearly a, a year before refugee families began arriving in the winter of 1983. According to Ramirez, these properties were on the trouble list. Local organizers, as well as officials with the city's housing preservation and development, considered these buildings to be among the most derelict properties in the neighborhood. Quote, who would be crazy enough to move into one of the, those buildings? Ramirez asked. The colleague, she asked the colleague who had brought her news of these new arrivals. I'm not sure, the colleague replied. Something about refugees from Thailand. Ramirez recalls, I remember the first refugee apartment I visited. It had nothing, an entire family sharing mats in the middle of a living room floor. That was all the furniture they had. The rest of the belongings, clothes, some supplies, were neatly stacked against the wall. The first question that came to my mind was, OK, you're from a war, but why come here? I mean, here we are, blacks and Latinos, just trying to survive this crazy situation and somebody thought to place them here? I recall an African-American tenant saying to me, hey, that building was abandoned. Now they got Chinese people from a war living in there. What the hell's going on? Look, if they could put people from a war in there, then this world is a bad, bad place. The long-standing residents felt compassion for the refugees, even as they mistook the latter's nationality but they were no less bewildered by the presence of these newcomers. They could hardly divine what, f divine what forces led them from a war zone to this particular section of the Bronx teetering on collapse. Certainly, the resettlement of refugees to these units was not what a coalition of black leaders, among them Jesse Jackson, Julian Bond, 
and Roy Wilkins had in mind when in 1979, they took out that full page ad in the New York Times, urging President Carter to resettle thousands of refugees who were languishing in makeshift border camps throughout Southeast Asia. These civil rights stalwarts framed the resettlement of refugees as a matter of racial justice, one that was tied to the goals of the ongoing black freedom movement. You can't read that ad, but there's an image of it, and I'll read more from it. Our struggle for economic and political freedom is inextricably, inextricably linked to the struggle of Indochinese refugees who also seek freedom, the ad says. If our government lacks compassion for these dispossessed human beings, it is difficult to believe that the same government can have much compassion for America's black minority or for America's poor. So by asserting this inextricable link between the black freedom struggle and the freedom sought by refugees, the ad suggests that refugee resettlement to the United States is a referendum on whether or not the Civil Rights Project will extend into the 1980s and beyond. The ad also invokes the expansive vision of civil rights, reminding the public that the movement was, at its best, internationalist and class conscious. It also calls upon the nation to be compassionate, something it must certainly demonstrate following the brutalities of the Vietnam War. Compassion for refugees, the advertisement reasons, will no doubt redound to the black community as it continues to struggle against racism and poverty. Now, Carter would eventually sign into law the Refugee Act of 1980, doing just as the civil rights leaders implored of him. But the signatories to the full page ad did not anticipate that the refugees were going to be resettled into neighborhoods where compassion was a vanishing proposition, for, especially for its longstanding black and Latino residents. By the late 1970s, these neighborhoods were becoming what sociologist Luis Waquant terms hyperghettos. Okay? These are post-insurrectionary neighborhoods, right? Neighborhoods that burned during the late 1960s, during the urban unrest, that then became or were then, were then uh, punished and abandoned by the state. Despite the state recognizing that, yes, structural racism was the reason that we had urban unrest, its response was a dual strategy of punishment and neglect, abandoning these neighborhoods, refusing to rebuild them, and then also militarizing the police forces to better confine and control those who remained. And so these spaces became warehouses to punish the poorest of the urban poor who are no longer seen as productive, right? Their role, rather, if they had a productive role, was to serve as those who were um, symbolically stigmatized, right? Those who would be constrained and ostracized in order to police the broader working poor. Now, um, for some, the hyper-ghetto represents an ongoing and indefinite state of low intensity warfare, what some would describe as liberal warfare. And this is um, warfare, and I'm gonna borrow the definition that Mimi Wynn in her book, The Gift of Freedom, provides, because I think it's an excellent um, definition. This is warfare waged not in the name of human rights and freedom, but violence that is vital to the genealogy of human freedom, okay? In other words, it rec liberal warfare recognizes, or the term, or the concept of li liberal warfare recognizes that war is endemic to the delivery of US <coughs> liberalism and freedoms, okay? Now, within this hyper-ghetto space, within this space of low-intensity warfare, the state did not expect nor want new immigrants to resettle there. So in 1965, we had the, new, the, the, um, the Immigration Act right, of 1965, which brought in a wave of new immigrants, changed the demographic of Asian America from becoming um, mostly native-born to foreign-born. And while Asian Americans resettled throughout um, the city in poor neighborhoods, very few new Asian immigrants resettled to hyper-ghetto sites. Okay, these were not sites where people were supposed to arrive to. Right? These were sites that were meant to be abandoned 
sites of dispersal. Well, the lone new immigrant event, two hyperghettos, were Southeast Asian refugees who arrived following the 1980 Refugee Act. So in Unsettled, I argue that they become the lone new immigrant event. Right? No other group arrives in mass to these hyperghetto sites. Okay. And here's an image of the Bronx circa the late 1970s. It um, is a shot of what's called the Charlotte Street in the South Bronx. Okay. And to give you a sense of <coughs> Cambodian refugee resettlement to the hyperghetto in particular, of the nearly one million Southeast Asian refugees that were resettled between 1980 and 1994, these were the, this was the height, right, those 14 years were the, was the height of refugee resettlement following the Refugee Act. 150,000 Cambodian refugees were, uh, were part of that nearly one million uh, refugee wave. 55% of them were placed in some of the poorest inner city neighborhoods in the country. So the majority were placed in some of the poorest neighborhoods. And the 45% that were not, many of them eventually made their way to those poorest neighborhoods by way of what we call secondary migration. So they were, might have been resettled somewhere else, somewhere more rural, but found that those places were too isolating, right? There weren't, you know, they weren't next to, you know, other, other Cambodians, and so they made their way to um, these neighborhoods. Okay. Um, now, during the uh, 1980s, approximately 10,000 of that 150,000 resettled to the Bronx. Okay. Um, but by the mid-1990s, that Bronx population levels off at 4,000. So only 4,000 Cambodians remain in the Bronx by the mid-1990s. And this is because the vast majority of them found that the conditions were just too difficult and employment opportunities too scarce. To give you a sense of um, what poverty, employment, education, and welfare participation look like for Bronx Cambodians, by 2000, nearly 43% are living in poverty, nearly 24% are unemployed, 62% are without a high school education, and there's about an 80% welfare participation rate, meaning at least 80% um, of the population is receiving some form of, of welfare program. Okay. Now, how do we understand the presence of refugees in the hyper ghetto? I'll begin by agreeing with anthropologist Iwa Ong, who in her book, Buddha is Hiding, argues that the model minority thesis is irrelevant here, right? By the early 1990s, she argues that journalists and policymakers begin removing Cambodians and Laotians, who also demonstrate similar um, statistics, from the model minority category, separating them from, quote, ethnic Chinese immigrants from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, along with Vietnamese immigrants. So while the Chinese, the ethnic Chinese, and the Vietnamese are hailed as model minorities, Cambodians, Laotians are out. But having been cast out of the model minority, the question becomes, how are these Southeast Asian refugee groups going to be figured by hegemonic racism? So if they're not model minorities, what are they? That is, what was their new racial location? Now, in Ong's assessment, Cambodians and Laotians were racialized as a new, quote, underclass. Specifically, she claims that they were subjected to, and I should back up and just say underclass is a pejorative term coined by sociologists to kind of deride and, um, and stigmatize um, unemployable and underemployed, mostly African Americans, right? To suggest that their intractable unemployment and poverty is a result of their failure to take personal responsibility, right? So underclass si symbolizes and signifies that ideology. So Ong argues that um, these Cambodians and Laotians were racialized as a new underclass. Specifically, she claims that they were subjected to a, quote, ideological blackening, in contrast to the whitening experienced by Vietnamese and ethnic Chinese immigrants, end quote. However, the terms of this blackening, with a, um, the terms of this blackening are unclear in Ong's rendering, 
On the one hand, she appears to equate blackening with a range of low-wage laborers mired in working poverty because they have few skills to succeed in the primary labor market. Among these are, quote, Ethiopians, Afghans, and even other Central Americans, end quote. On the other hand, however, she uses blackening to refer to the way in which Cambodians and Laotians are associated with Af poor African Americans, with high unemployment, with welfare dependency, and teenage pregnancy um, because of their, quote, location and isolation in inner city neighborhoods, end quote. So in making the case for a blackening of the refugee, Ang is conflating two very distinct racial formations, right? On the one hand, she's saying they're like Afghans and Central Americans, and on the other hand, she's saying, well, actually, no, they're like the African American um, poor. Well, notwithstanding these conceptual dilemmas, Ong's analysis leads me to question how a blackening of this sort, the making of a new underclass out of refugees, was possible under the terms of liberal warfare in the hyperghetto. In other words, how was it possible for refugees to suddenly become the enemies of liberalism? Were they now being targeted for dispersal, divestment, planned shrinkage, and other low-intensity war tactics? Allow me to return to Mimi Wynn's definition of liberal warfare as violence that claims to be, quote, incidental to its exercise of power to free others from a named enemy who is in their midst, end quote. I argue that, the Northwest Bronx, that in the Northwest Bronx and in other hyper ghettos of the early 1980s, black and to varying degrees Latino tenants were targeted as the primary enemies of liberalism to be dispersed by plan, plan shrinkage or punished for staying behind in these hollowed out post-insurrectionary ghettos. Southeast Asians were inserted into these sites of liberal warfare as those who should be rescued from this war, to be rescued from these sites as those deserving of freedom. However, to grant liberal, warf well, liberal warfare's continuance, the rescue could never be realized. So it wasn't a real rescue. It was a discursive one, right? Ideological one. Instead, refugees were continuously positioned as collateral damage, those incidentally injured in the war to rescue them. Specifically, they were held in derelict housing conditions so that they could be targeted for a rescue that could never take place, a fictive rescue that justified liberal warfare. These and other forms of ongoing urban captivity rendered talk of the model minority irrelevant, but this did not mean that Southeast Asian refugees were subjected to the same forms of vilif vilification and ridicule that were directed at the putative underclass. Instead, I argue that Cambodian refugees were subjected to an alternative uh, set of discursive practices that I term refugee exceptionalism. The ideologies and discursive practices that figure refugees as necessarily in the hyperghetto, but never of it. It is a process whereby refugees are resettled into and then recurrently saved from the hyperghetto and its attendant modalities of captivity. Uninhabitable housing stock, permanent exclusion from the labor market, and punitive social policy. However, refugee exceptionalism never actually removes the refugee from hyperghetto spaces and institutions. Certainly not, not in any material sense, right? On the contrary, it requires that she be held in perpetual captivity so that she can be used over and again. Okay. The goals of refugee exceptionalism are twofold. First, it masks the systemic inequalities and violences of a refugee resettlement program that, as an extension of US colonial and imperial projects in Southeast Asia, proclaimed Cambodians and other Southeast Asians or other Southeast Asian refugees to be beneficiaries of American liberal freedoms that the United States could not successfully deliver through its acts of warfare and invasion. By casting refugees as subsisting in an unending state of arrival at liberalism, those whose struggles with poverty in the urban United States was deemed perpetually temporary and, quote, adaptive, 
refugee exceptionalism preserves and extends the narrative of the Southeast Asian subject's salvation through U.S. intervention. Second, by insisting that refugees be saved from the grips of the underclass, it reinforces the terms that produce African Americans, and again, to varying degrees, Latinos, as the undeserving poor, quote, domestic minorities for whom the underclass concept was originally formulated. In other words, refugee exceptionalism preserves and extends the justification for punishment of certain populations in the hyperghetto. We might say that taken together, the Cambodian refugee presence in the hyperghetto, mediated through refugee exceptionalism, represents the convergence of two distinct yet relational genealogies of white supremacist governance, colonialism and slavery. Ra's presence here elucidates the hyperghetto's, the hyperghetto as slavery's afterlife. In turn, the hyperghetto as anti-blackness reveals the contours of an unfinished colonialism. So how did this all play out on the ground, right? How did it all play out in the Bronx? And in the book, <coughs> I, um, oh, here's an image of um, one of the first refugee families to be resettled uh, to the area. This photo is taken, um, I believe, in 1983. And um, let me get that date right. Yeah, I believe it's at 83. And a photographer um, is just kind of roaming the Bronx, kind of t taking pictures of the burnt out buildings and stumbles across, literally stumbles across a Cambodian family. And that's how people knew like Cambodians had been resettled to the Bronx. And this picture appears in a book called um, The South Bronx of America. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So how did, it, how did all of this refugee exceptionalism play out on the ground? Well, in the book, I talk about one woman and her family, Ra Pran. And I speak about how her multiple housing displacements um, that she experienced and that other refugees experienced over the, cor the course of um, two decades illustrate the ways in which um, refugee exceptionalism takes shape. So with each housing displacement, the resettlement agency failed to move Ra and her family to another neighborhood with better housing and less violence. It merely relocated them to the next vacant apartment in the same troubled area. Each placement seemed only to renew Ra's captivity in the liberal warfare that was the hyperghetto. However, those handling Ra's, um, Ra's case, as, as it were, engaged in refugee exceptionalism, telling her that her situation was only temporary, that the hardships of the Northwest Bronx were, was, only, were only, um, was only a stop along the way to something better. To be sure, many Cambodians left the Bronx, but most did not find improved situations. They only moved laterally to other hyperghettos throughout the Northeast, Philadelphia, Providence, Lowell, New Haven, Hartford. Many of those who stayed in the Bronx continued to live in derelict apartments in which they were originally resettled. Others, like Ra, simply moved from one substandard apartment to the next within the same square two miles. All told, the Cambodians of the Northwest Bronx experienced no economic mobility, even as resettlement agencies, landlords, and, others, and other keepers of the hyperghetto over three decades consistently hailed them as perpetual newcomers on the verge of something else, as those only passing through. During the late 1990s, when I began working as a community organizer in the Northwest Bronx, I advocated for Cambodian refugee families in the very same buildings that Ramirez had attempted to organize over a decade earlier. I helped Cambodian tenants file complaints against building owners who were guilty of numerous habitability law laws and violations. The landlords accused me of being an interloper, an agitator, echoing the social workers that stymied Ramirez's organizing <coughs> efforts decades earlier. They referred to Cambodian refugees as their, quote, new tenants who, unlike the longer established black and Latino tenants, had never given them any trouble until now. They seemed unable to fathom that the Cambodian tenants had actually been living in their buildings for over 15 years. But at the same time, they did not cast these refugees as model minority strivers. The landlords knew full well that Cambodians were not economically mobile. 
if they preferred Cambodians over African Americans and Puerto Ricans, it was because the newcomers were impoverished third world subjects who had made slum buildings solvent again. They paid their rent and rarely complained about poor housing conditions that they endured. This made them valuable not as model minorities, but as continuous captives who did not transgress into hyper-ghetto status. In keeping with the terms of refugee exceptionalism, the Cambodian refugees constantly renewed their status as those who were only in, but never of, the hyper-ghetto. The consistency with which numerous agents practiced it over time, that is, refugee exceptionalism, over several decades, that is, points to refugee exceptionalism's vast discursive power. Indeed, it was not limited to the conscious actions of these agents as they attempted to meet certain political and economic ends. Rather, social workers, landlords, social scientists even, were also drawing on and in turn reinforcing an implicit body of knowledge that produced the refugee subject. As a community organizer, I noticed how refugee exceptionalism as subject producing discourse was carried out in philanthropy. Right? Foundations that supported our work insisted that the poverty, joblessness, and poor health of South Southeast Asian refugees was a matter of immigrant, quote, adaptation. <coughs> and there's some folks who are more than familiar with this stuff who are in the room, so I'll let you speak to that during the discussion. In this way, they decoupled these violences from the broader war being waged against all inhabitants of the hyperghetto. Refugee exceptionalism came across similarly in my conversations with neighborhood school teachers who attributed the struggles of their Cambodian students to their newcomer status, even though many of these students had been born in the Bronx. The suggestion was that the Cambodian students' poor <coughs> grades and high dropout rates had little to do with the general assault on inner city public education. The discourse of refugee exceptionalism was particularly pronounced in the mainstream media's coverage of the Bronx, Cambodians. Since the mid-1980s, the New York Times, and I know I'm picking on the New York Times a lot, right? It's like how we make our careers here. Um, you could edit that out of the tape, by the way. Um, <laughs> Since the mid-1980s, the New York Times had been one of the few major newspapers to periodically cover the borough's small Cambodian enclave. A cursory review of its articles from 1994 through 2012 reveals the consistent representation of Cambodians as perpetual newcomers to the Bronx hyperghetto. In, in October of 1994, the Times ran a profile of Bronx Cambodians in which Sister Jean Marshall, director of a local assistance group known as St. Rita's Refugee Center, gave her assessment of how long it takes a refugee to finally feel settled. Quote, between 10 and 15 years for a Southeast Asian refugee to become a non-refugee, end quote. And she attributed this length of time to the various economic and cultural and social obstacles that refugees must overcome. According to Sister Jean's timeline, by 1994, when this article was printed, the earliest refugee arrivals had already transitioned, either already transitioned into non-refugee status or they were on the cusp of doing so, right? In 2000, though, the Times published another profile of the community that suggested that the refugees were nowhere near shedding their refugee past. Children of the Killing Fields was the name of the article, and it focused on Cambodian teenagers noting that these, quote, young people also face a host of distinctive problems and few community groups exist to help out new arrivals, end quote. However, it, it had been 18 years since the first wave of Cambodian resettlement to the Bronx, and most of the teenagers interviewed for that article, and I know because I actually was the person who gave the reporter <laughs> the context for these teenagers, were born in either refugee camps or in the Bronx. Okay. They knew nothing or little, of nothing, little to nothing of life in Cambodia or the Thai camps. Their and yet their problems were framed as those of newcomers, distinct from those of established residents. Even as late as 2012, 30 years after the arrival of the first wave of Cambodians to the Bronx, 
Another Times piece commented that refugees were still struggling to, quote, strike a balance between adopting American customs and holding fast to values from home, end quote. In these and similar Times articles, the refugees are frozen in time. Indeed, over three decades, they are continuously in a state of arrival. They are not allowed to be anything other than the hyper ghettos recurring newcomers. And yet, these articles refrain from casting refugees as model minority paragons of liberalism. Instead, they appear as captives who must be repeatedly saved from the named enemies of liberalism, namely the post-insurrectionary underclass. Here, once again, the Cambodian refugees are enlisted as the collateral damage of liberal warfare. The challenge moving forward for both relational racial studies and critical refugee studies is to understand how these refugee rescues and removals, this refusal to recognize the refugees' settledness to the hyperghetto, stages anti-blackness. Indeed, to figure Bronx Cambodians as suspended in a perpetual state of arrival is to disassociate refugee poverty from that of the, quote, true inhabitants of the hyperghetto, the true enemies of liberalism. Casting this dynamic in terms of liberal warfare, we might say that refugee exceptionalism insists on the unending rescue of the Cambodian refugee from urban abjection as a way to justify unending warfare against an undeserving and definitively black urban population. Thank you. And I'm so bad with my slides, but I want to just show you know, you one thing by way, because I, and also I end on like this note, which is kind of like, oh. But I, what I wanted to do was really end on a note around activism. Despite refugee exceptionalism <laughs> and all they've endured, the book also focuses on the organizing that is happening among Cambodian refugees. And here is an image from a protest we did circa 1998. It's outside of a health center that was, um, that had a program for Southeast Asian refugees and it was being threatened with cuts to that program. So keep your eye on the woman at the center of this photo uh, with the stop discrimination placard. Okay. Well, this summer, summer 2015, this past summer, I went back to the Bronx, you know, checking on everyone say what's up, and there was another protest for the same issue, because we had won back then, right? We restored the funding, but you know, years later, um, 17 years later, they decide that they're going to try to introduce new cuts. Well, I snapped a photograph in the summer of 2015 of the latest protest, and didn't realize until I got home that <laughs> there she is again, all right? She's sitting this time, we'll give her a break, right? She, she earned it. So um, there's a consistency to, um, to people's struggles, and it's not just about survival, right? It doesn't, it's not, the limit isn't survival. There's also some, um, some real organizing work that's happening. And lastly, I just wanted to kind of put up some resources for you all to learn more about um, you know, what's going on with, with the Bronx community, what's going on nationally with um, organizing among Cambodian and other Southeast Asian refugees. So Mekong NYC uh, is the group in the Bronx that, has, that I talk about in the, in the book and is doing some inf incredible work among Bronx Cambodians. Um, their director and founder, Chaya Chaum, is featured in the book. There's also the One Love Movement that comes out of Philadelphia, uh, and it has a current campaign that uh, is trying to, to, to organize Cambodian Americans who've been deported back to Cambodia. And I say back in quotes because, you know, as um, Sarath and others can tell you, some of these young men had, and have never lived in Cambodia until they had been deported, right? Um, you have PRISM, the Providence um, Youth and Student Movement, which many of you know about here in Providence that does terrific work with Cambodian and other um, youth of color. And they're part of the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, which is the last link. Uh, and you can learn more about, you know, the work of, of that group by going there or by just talking to Sarath, who was here. <laughs>
um, and who I would prefer to like maybe hand the Q&A over to, but I know I'm not allowed to do that since, um, anyway, Nancy. <laughs> So uh, we're very fortunate that Dr. Tang has agreed to sign copies of this book, which will be available for purchase after the Q and A. Um, and we do have some time for questions. So please, if you, do you want to feel you seem to know more people here than I do? So okay. <laughs> your own questions, sure, or comments. Oh yeah. Uh, so thank you. I mean, this is terrific. Um, I guess. I'm I want to ask a question about the <clears throat> sorry, about the durability, mm -hmm. yeah, right, of the of the myth, the durability, and not just the myth, but of the, the ways in which the culture is structured for the refugees in, in the Bronx. Right? Um, and so, the, and really, it's a question about the ambitions of the the activists, yeah. right, to disrupt and to thwart the durability of those narratives, mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, it's one thing to have this kind of meta discourse about you know um, refugee exceptionalism, right? but how does that get translated into the activism that they have such that they can try to change the narrative, understanding the complicity with you know, the larger American exceptionalist narratives that you talked about earlier. So um, the durability of, of the... Well, we the know it's durable, right? But, what, I, the, but, but the question is, like, the activists can find ways to disrupt mm -hmm. the right? right. Yeah, you know, I think... Um, the, as I see it, there's uh, a strategic move that the organizers and the activists have to make around um, working with those who are sympathetic to refugee resettlement as a humanitarian cause, while also knowing that this kind of sympathy, right, and this kind of um, claim to refugee deservedness is, works hand in hand with all forms of state violence, yeah. right? And so, um, so I think the challenge is to, is to kind of get off the bus at a certain point, right? With, um, with, with these humanitarian narratives and to challenge them outright when it's strategic to do so. And we see that even now with um, you know, this discourse around Syrian refugees. So the discourse has moved so far to the right that those of us who want to ask, well, what happens to refugees once they actually are resettled can't even have that conversation because we're stuck at please resettle them because they're not a security risk, <coughs> right? And there's no room in the debate to say, well, actually, when they get here, the vast majority are going to live in decades of work in poverty because guess what? We have a really bad policy around what we call immediate employment for refugees. We think it's a good thing, liberals and conservatives, that we get 80% refugee employment placement months after they're resettled. Like it's a good idea to force people who are still struggling from PTSD into working poor jobs three months after they get here, right? I can't, we can't even have that discussion because it's stuck on Again, they're not a security risk. Please let them in. So, you know, I think the challenge is how do you, you know, get on that bus f for a while, but then abruptly get off and, um, and, and participate in, in, in something else. So there's a versatility that I would say that accompanies organizing in refugee communities that, um, that I see, you know, organizers like Sarath, organizers like Chaya engage in day to day. They're not going to eschew those who want to help him, but there is, there is, there's a deep suspicion they also hold for these, um, these humanitarian narratives, right? Anyone? Yes. Thank you so much for your um, critical interventions into how we think about freedom and topics of post-war refugees. I'm wondering if you know why that Facebook group is called the Freedom Network. Um, yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah, uh, co-founder and uh, executive director of the Providence Youth Student Movement here in Rhode Island. Um, PRISM, um, we're celebrating our 15th year, actually this year. 
We were founded um, in 2001 to respond to the need for there to be leadership development um, and organizing among Southeast Asian youth living in Providence. We saw that, you know, much of what's been sort of illustrated here, that our community sort of has, has been stuck in these cycles of violence from war to, 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 to refugee resettlement to racial profiling to deportation. And so we really want to take the time to really develop our young people and train them to become organizers that we can break our communities out of these cycles of violence. We're also um, one of the founding members of the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, CFEN. CFEN was found back in the day in like around 2002 um, in the Bronx um, to respond to the deportation crisis that was happening in the Cambodian community back then. Um, and we sort of, you know, when we, for us, we thought about what freedom means, right? Um, and when we came together, we sort of, we, had a, we came up with a shared analysis about what it means for us as refugees, as um, Southeast Asians who are, who are products of really, products of U.S. colonialism, imperialism, um, and what it means for us then to come here, be in these sort of communities, and be under constant state violence. For us, freedom meant being able to just live without fear of violence. Being able to live without fear that we were going to get killed, or that we were going to thrown in camps, or that we were going to get profiled or thrown in prisons. And so, the, the, the idea behind Calling Ourselves the Freedom Man was that we, we, we wanted to sort of lift our communities out of these cycles of violence so that we could finally be free. Um, but we also just restarted CFIN in the past couple of years to yet again respond to the deportation crisis that's continuing to happen in the Cambodian community. Yes. So my question is inspired by, by what we just heard. I was wondering, I work on the Middle East, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, um, in the current discourse about Syrian refugees, there is no discussion whatsoever of U.S. responsibility for the right. events that precipitated the refugee crisis. How is that the same or different in terms of just the discourse around colonialism and, and various imperial projects that resulted in, in this influx right. at this time? It's an excellent point. <coughs> you know, what I write about in the conclusion, or what I... I speculate in the conclusion is that um, we may have seen the last of the so-called good refugee. That refugee who is kind of enlisted to, um, to be the beneficiary of what Mimi Wynn calls this gift of freedom, right? That is really a debt that you can never repay. <laughs> Right? That is really an extension of liberal warfare. Um, and I don't think it's just because we're in a post-Cold War moment. I, I think it's more complicated than that. But we may have seen the end of um, that good refugee who was, who was used in liberal warfare in that way, who could be used in the hyper-ghetto in, in this particular way. And you, you see that too, not just with what's happening around Syrian refugees in the Middle East, but if you paid attention to how the unaccompanied minors from Central America were treated too, it was just, and we're responsible for those internal disruptions, you know, a coup, right? Our, our drug war, and yet no responsibility. And so I think, you know, it isn't so much, or just, just a post-Cold War, condition, but it's a post-9-11 doctrine <laughs> condition where um, the doctrine suggests two things. A, national security trumps all other concerns, and B, we can never really keep you safe. And those two, um, that coupling makes it impossible for the United States to take responsibility for its internal disruptions elsewhere as it once did, right? Because everything that gets reframed as, well, it's all about our national security. And it also makes it impossible for um, anyone to introduce, you know, well, what happens is, you know, your, your evidence that actually refugees pose absolutely no security threat gets treated uh, with equal weight as those who can simply say they do without any evidence at all, right? And so I think that is the moment that we're in, which suggests to me that we may have seen the last of the good refugees. So I am not, in conclusion, um, suggesting that what I write about when it comes to Southeast Asian refugees, uh, that there's an easy analog with the current moment, the current conjecture. 
So I know that for us in PRISM and in CIFAN organizations, we, when we um, began to organize the need to build that narrative of why we were here and why, and why it's important for us to organize our communities, we definitely, at, from the very beginning, wanted to make sure that we named the U.S. As, as the primary reason by why we're here in, the, in, the, in this country. Um, you know, I mean, back then we were, um, you know, there's that communist scare, right? So it's like if you were a communist, or um, you automatically sort of like seen, um, you automatically criminalized. And so for us, we, um, it was important for us in this analysis to, to name to our young people, to our community members, and to, and to, the, and to our young leaders that we're not here, we, we're not here because we're de we were destined to be miserable and to always live this life. We were here because of U.S. foreign policy. And that's always been a tenet of what we teach our young people in our community. Um, and you know, it's also like the U this country has a very weird, okay, where's a weird word, but uh, it's a very weird um, understanding of what happened during the Vietnam War in this, in this country's uh, involvement in those wars, right? I mean, we call it the American War. And so for us, we knew that we came here because the U.S. invaded and came into our countries and caused those conditions for us to be here in the first place. So whether or not the, the mainstream narrative, the national narrative um, talked about it, we talked about it within ourselves, in our communities and in our organizations. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, always amazing work. And the last time you were at Brown, not so long ago, you mm -hmm. were talking about solidarity efforts in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted you to speak just a little bit because, I mean, in the audience you have students from across the university, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's so telling and exciting about your work is not just the important critical collaboration that you have with community groups. Um, I mean, you know, if Brown is trying to build a gauge scholarship, mm -hmm. <laughs> they have right. a good, they have a good, whatever they're trying to build with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's critical work that you're doing in modeling that I think is important to know. Uh, but also that you work within Asian American studies, critical refugee studies, and African American and diaspora studies. And so I wanted you to speak a little bit about um, how in your work you bring to light really critical solidarity efforts in community organizing, but then in your work how you also are bridging these different uh, really, really uh, critical and radical theories um, right. to bring the stories to life. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, I'm... A hat tip to Brown, you know, Sarath is being modest, he's actually a Brown alum. And so, you know, sometimes I'm not attributing it all to Brown, don't get me wrong, but you know, there's, people make connections, right, and they, um, but on solidarity, you know, solidarity to me, or especially racial solidarity between, you know, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, is not about the leveling of difference, right? It is not about creating the easy analogies. We're all in the same boat. You know, look at the situation involving Cambodian Americans. Their conditions are just like that of African Americans. On the one hand, or at one level, that might be true, right? We, kind of, we see, like, in fact, in the housing situation, their conditions were, were far worse, right? So, you know, there's the immediate conditions that we can read, but what we have to do is also read a bit deeper. And what I mean by that is we have to understand how the Cambodian refugee is racialized, is positioned, racialized and gendered, which is, you know, the argument I make in this particular book, how Ra's racialized and gendered in a very particular way that does two things. It reinforces punishment against African Americans and at the same time renders her struggles invisible, does nothing for her. So even as the refugee is decoupled from, right, separated from the discourse of the underclass, she's not celebrated. <laughs> She's not a beneficiary <laughs> of that decoupling. In fact, what that does is it actually obscures what she's going through in, in, a, in a more profound way, which means that she is, it reinforces her oppression. <laughs> but again, that has to be the basis of solidarity, not sameness, you know? Not sameness, but 
the way in which the distinct racial and gendered positioning of the Southeast Asian refugee upholds her oppression at the same time upholds anti-blackness. That to me is where solidarity really matters and to understand that means engaging with some uncomfortable differences, right? And being okay with that as opposed to trying to approach solidarity as, you know, a process in arriving at some unity of thought and action. experiences of the first wave of refugees and their children. I mean, as a child born from a immigrant family, yeah. though we weren't refugees, um, the, the ways in which we attempt to assimilate or identify with the American identity is really different from how our parents uh, process that. And I was wondering how those two things are bridged in mm -hmm. activism and what that relationship looks like. Because I can imagine that now in 2016, the people who are at the forefront of this movement may not necessarily be the people, or maybe I'm completely wrong, but it seems like it would be a partnership or a collaboration or a combination of different moments in the narrative. Yeah. So by first um, wave, you talk, you're talking about the, the generation of adults who were resettled in the 1980s, and by second generation or second wave, you're talking about their children. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question, and it's, um, it's a real challenging one to answer, and here's why. There's another term I uh, elaborate on in the book, and it's called refugee temporality. It's like the way in which the refugee who's resettled here knows that her past captivities are unbroken with her present ones, right? She's not going to speak about that openly for fear of sounding like an ingrate, or you know, people are going to misunderstand that she's still happy to be alive here in the United States but that the, kind of, the forms of social death that she's exposed to are real, okay? And, um, and refugee temporality also names the way that she continues to move as a refugee, as a fugitive in her, in her current environment. And, you know, Ra is the, ex, is the perfect example of that. Like she's not under any illusion that she's landed somewhere that she can count on. She keeps her survival skills honed. And her children, who are older and remember the camps, also have some of that. Okay, so Ra has seven children. The five who were born either in Cambodia or in the camps, right, are um, the only five of her children that actually graduated high school. The two that were born in the United States fell into a, a considerable amount of trouble. Which suggests what? That the younger generation is in a more precarious situation. And I asked her kids why. And they said, listen, man, I know this is going to sound weird, but I just think the young people, they just die more easily. And she, and she went on. This is um, Roz, one of her daughters. And I interpreted that as unlike their parents and unlike the older you know, young people, they don't possess their own sense of refugee time, right? All they know is life in the hyper-ghetto and the false promises of liberalism. And so, in the view of Ra's children, the younger generation, the youngest generation, die more easily. It was a haunting statement, you know, and I just left it as is in the conclusion. I didn't try to analyze it or edit it more. I just left it as, as is. But again, not to end on a completely pessimistic note, I think what that suggests is that the organizing that we need to do in these communities is more vital than ever. And so what I really end on is a shout to groups like PRISM and Mekong and other groups that work with these, these youngest Southeast Asian refugees, right? But in coalition with African Americans and Latinos and by addressing issues at an intersectional way. Now, it's not just about race, it's also about gender, sexuality, immigration status, deportation. Those kind of organizations have to be front and center, right? Because if the youngest generation, if it's true, if there's some truth to the fact that they don't possess their own sense of refugee time, then organizations like this are essential. Otherwise, they do die more easily.